Uh, welcome to the fourth of our entrepreneurship panel sessions brought to you by the John Martinson Center for Engineering, as well as the Burton D. Morgan Center for Entrepreneurship. A special thanks to Professor Young Liu for organizing these panel sessions and for all the panelists for making time uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Arnold Chen and I'm the Managing Director for the Burton D. Morgan Center for Entrepreneurship on campus. And um, for the current students who are listening, I'll be uploading into the chat uh, a few documents. The first document, just so you know, is just a high level overview of all of the different uh, resources that are available to students. And then the second would be a one pager that describes uh, our, particularly our Center for Entrepreneurship. And the last one will be a call out for our annual business model competition, which Kushal knows much about having been the winner as well as Katie back in 2017. Uh, so today you'll be hearing from four uh, alumni entrepreneurs who uh, just a few years ago were sitting where you were sitting today. And we're gonna be hearing about their startups and their journey. So first I'd like to introduce our two moderators for the panel session today. The first is Isha, as she mentioned earlier, she's a senior in computer engineering and psychology. She's participated in business competition and is interested in going to graduate school to create technology that could potentially be used to create new industries. And Fisher, who also introduced himself earlier, is also a senior in computer engineering. He's been part of Dr. Liu's research team for the past year and a half. Fisher is aiming to be an entrepreneur and is working on submitting an SBIR proposal to help fund his startup. Both Isha and Fisher are co-leaders of the COVID-19 team in Dr. Liu's lab, and they'll be interviewing our panelists. Isha and Fisher. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, thank you. Yeah, so uh, thankfully we have some great people attending the panel today. I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, first of all, we have Kushal. He is the co-founder and chief product officer of Glimpse. Um, he's currently a senior studying uh, computer engineering at Purdue, set to graduate in three years. Uh, the company he co-founded, Glimpse, was the winner of the Burton D. Morgan Business Model Competition. Um, Glimpse does product placements in Airbnbs and has received an investment from Y Combinator, which is the world's uh, top startup accelerator, which has built companies such as Airbnb, Stripe, DoorDash, Instacart, and Twitch, and he is currently building his startup full-time. Uh, Catherine is the uh, chief executive officer and co-founder of Omnibus. Catherine uh, works at Omnibus where they produce devices to detect infectious diseases to prevent wide-scale outbreaks. She believes healthcare should be a right, not a privilege. Uh, she received her education at Purdue University and the California Polytechnic State University where she studied biomedical engineering. Uh, and finally, we have Everett Berry, who is the CEO of uh, Perceive, now known as Visitor X. Um, he's a graduate of Purdue University, used to be in the Camp Square team as well with Dr. Liu. Um, he studied computer engineering and he is the principal investigator for a National Science Foundation SBIR proposal where he received a federal grant. Um, so those are our panelists today. Uh, before we move on to any questions, Isha is gonna go over a entrepreneurship course that Purdue is currently offering. Yeah, so I'll quickly talk about Build My Startup. So Build My Startup is a course designed for companies in execution and expansion stages. The faculty advisors and the industrial mentors will help the students improve their value propositions, identify markets, assess business models, create product prototypes and develop strategies for raising funds. The students must have already completed an initial assessment of the value proposition, target markets and customers. And this team is designed for student entrepreneurs that are already building their startups and the student must have already registered their companies before joining this team. So this is a new uh, VIT, VIP team at Purdue, Vertically Integrated Projects. Risha. So before moving on, um, I'd like to ask the panelists to take a couple minutes to talk about their journey and what motivated you and inspired you to move into entrepreneurship. So Kushal, could you go ahead and start us off? Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me guys. But um, I'd love to talk about how uh, I started off with Glimpse. So actually what motivated me to get involved in entrepreneurship was in high school, uh, my senior year of high school, I started a tutoring business in my town. Uh, and that went really well. I had like three employees, was tutoring like 30 students. And that's when I first got involved in entrepreneurship and I really fell in love with the entire process. So coming into college, I was looking for ways to get involved with um, entrepreneurship on campus. 
Uh, and that's when I joined an entrepreneurship professional fraternity called Delta Mu Kappa. Um, and that's where I met Akash. He's one of my co-founders. Uh, he was my big um, at DMK. And so we started working on side projects uh, for a whole, like a few months for an entire semester, um, trying to get to know each other better and starting to build, um, working on problems and trying to build something and get it off the ground. And I think that's what really sparked the glimpse. We started off doing like, um, small college startups. So we would do like campus deliveries. We were doing like um, try before you buy service for clothing. So we created a business where people could basically um, rent clothing. We'd go and pick it up from the store. They could try it out in their dorm. And if they like it, they purchase it. If they don't, we return it. We tried a lot of different ideas. Um, and then that's when my third co-founder, Anuj, joined. Uh, and we started working on pop-up shops on campuses. Uh, and this is really where things started to take off. So um, we started doing pop-ups on campuses and we would basically cold call brands, um, tell them like, hey, do you wanna get in front of tens of thousands of students? We can help you do that. And so we started getting in contact with different brands, bringing them onto campuses and tried to create like experiential retail marketing initiatives. Um, and I think the entire process of just doing things that we wanted to um, and creating a product that we really enjoyed and passionate about uh, was what started us getting involved in entrepreneurship. And this was when I was a freshman. So we really got our toes dipped in into the world of entrepreneurship. And then going into sophomore year of college is when we really got serious about it. Um, and then we started looking for ways to scale the business. So we were doing things like um, one-off consultant type pop-ups for these businesses, but we were looking for ways to use software to scale it. And that's when we stumbled across the idea of Glimpse, um, using Airbnbs and other short-term rentals to get products from these brands placed um, as kind of like a marketing initiative. And I guess that's where the whole journey started for us. And then we got funded by Y Combinator and we're working on it full-time now. Awesome, congratulations. Thank you. Um, Catherine, could you go ahead and tell us about your business? Yeah, sure, and, and how I got here. So I did biomedical engineering as an undergrad, and I really wanted to do that because when I was a little kid, somebody in my family had died from full-blown AIDS, and it was the first time I understood kind of what disease was. And so that stuck with me throughout the years, and I go to college, and I'm a little bit bored. I liked my classes, but I didn't know where I wanted to go next. And I did a study abroad trip and was working in this rural area in Thailand with Engineers Without Borders and began to learn about appropriate technology. How can you bring medical devices or other types of technology more out to the user and make healthcare more accessible? And so I was graduating from my degree and I'm sitting there going, I still don't feel ready yet. I, I wanna do something with appropriate technology. I don't know what. And so I went to Purdue for my PhD and I see Steve Worley is on the Zoom call. He was my PhD advisor in the mechanical engineering department. And I wanted to build up my tool belt. And when I was there, there was a gal in one of the labs I was working in who was telling me about this disease cholera. And it was kind of like all of these things came together, that my love of appropriate technology, my love of making healthcare more accessible. And I had learned Cholera was something that didn't exist in Haiti for 100 years until the earthquake. And it came to the country and it went across the country in a matter of weeks and it created outbreaks and deaths until really recently. And it's not just Haiti, there's 41 countries around the world that have cholera. So I kind of said, this is, this is the moment. This is the moment where things are coming together. What can I do? And I've been working on my PhD on a variety of different things and decided to apply some of the work I was doing to see if we could do some sort of detection platform and particularly with cholera, this, this waterborne pathogen, and saw that it was successful. So how does this become a company? Well, I never thought that it would become a company, I'll be honest, but started to enter these pitch competitions around campus, like the Schur's Innovation Competition and the Burton Morgan Business Plan Competition, and kind of started to get that feedback. And that was really exciting. And then started to go out more into the community and talk to people and see if there was that interest and, and create that fire. Um, and so we started the company officially in 2017. Um, I was completing a postdoc after that at Purdue and then did a few accelerators after that to see how we could take off and finally moved to San Francisco and got funding for the company and have been going ever since. Well, that's awesome. I'm glad you took advantage of a lot of things in college because I think a lot of people here will be interested in hearing your experiences with those programs. 
Um, and finally, Everett, uh, thank you for coming. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your journey and what motivated you to start? Yeah, for sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's really uh, an honor to be with these other great panelists. In fact, Chris Shaw, I was just talking to Akash last hour uh, on another Zoom call. So, um, and, and Catherine, we, we haven't met yet, but I'm also in SF, um, and so we'd love to connect um, when we get the opportunity. But yeah, so um, Steve was a uh, camera technology company. We started um, several years ago while still in college with Dr. Lou, who's also on the call. And we were fortunate to write and receive, um, uh, at this point, at nearly like 1.8 million in um, NSF grants, um, non-dilutive grants to kind of build out the research technology for the company, which involves behavior recognition. And um, today, uh, as, as Visitor X, we provide a UX research product for real products. So think faucets, furniture, mattresses. Um, one of our customers is the largest faucet maker in the US. And we record video clips of customers interacting with these products and, um, and help them kind of design them better and, and market them to the right set of users. So um, yeah, we, we are deal with the physical world a lot and COVID has had a, a massive impact on our business, positive and negative. So excited to be here and, and tell you all about it. Awesome, thanks guys. Uh, okay, so we'll get right into the questions. Um, uh, we got questions from a lot of people that registered for the panel and one of the most popular questions was uh, How did you get your initial idea for your startup? So we've heard some talks about that so far um, But I'll take it a step further and ask how do you know when you have an idea and you're ready to transition it to a business? Um, how do you know when you're ready to take something full-time and really start developing that uh, into a commercial opportunity? Um, so anyone can just jump in and answer if they have anything to say on this matter. Yeah, I think I can go ahead. Um, I think in terms of first coming up with an idea, um, I think that in terms of coming up with ideas for me personally, it was just looking at problems in our everyday and just starting to work on it with people who are passionate about starting a business. So for me, that was just working with Akash and Anuj on the various different problems. And I think that just getting stuck on solving something, um, even if we didn't have an idea at first, but we had a problem to solve, um, it helped us get to that solution. So really what we realized, and I think the best way we've seen to start um, is just find a problem you're passionate about and start doing customer discovery. So find people who have that problem, a similar set of users who deal with that problem every day and run interviews with them, figure out like what are their major issues? What are their major concerns? And I think one of the strongest points for us is we have that .edu email. So as college students, we can send emails like marketing heads at tons of different companies, which really worked for us. And they would be able to get on the call with us for 30 minutes. Uh, and so that was really helpful for us to identify that a lot of these uh, direct to consumer online companies want to get their product into the physical world. Um, I think that's where we did a lot of our learnings from. So when you have a problem um, in mind, first identify the problem, find people who share that set of problems and then try to interview them, see if there is something that's similar across all of them. Uh, and once you identify that, you can definitely build a solution based off the feedback you get from them. Cool, so you'd say it's about uh, essentially validating that the problems you wanna solve actually exist. And that's how you determine if your idea is marketable. Yeah, yeah, I think that if a common set of people share the same problem and the market size is large enough, then it's definitely a business that you wanna attack. So a lot of you guys um, started working on your ideas when you were students. Um, and a lot of the people that are interested in this panel are also students that want to develop their uh, commercial ideas. So how do you balance that sort of um, work life between your academics and your uh, efforts growing your company? Uh, I can go on this one. Uh, so one of the things is it's really helpful if you have awesome founders that can help balance some of that load, for sure. Um, I think I got really lucky. My my founders are professors at Purdue. So if you see them around, you should go say hi to them. Uh, but also balancing the workload. It's not easy. If, if you really uh, want to be successful, it's not easy. Um, I, somebody on this panel said that they, they're working right now full time and they're going to be graduating in a few years. 
Um, for me, it was part of my thesis as well. So I like to say it was a two for one. I got to work on a thesis and do some of the, the underlying work, but I also got to do the pitch competitions, which I think helped me when I had to do my defense because I already knew how to talk about it to all kinds of people. Um, so I think that was a, a huge way that helped me balance my, my workload for sure. And just kind of seeing how many times I could get a two for one experience out of something. Yeah, I, I think Catherine's absolutely correct um, because the I think for many, including myself, there there actually is no balance. Um, if you want to pursue a company, um, and many people end up dropping out or they let their grades um, completely go to go to the wayside, um, a, unless it's maybe a research opportunity, which um, which is a slightly different case. But um, the great news is the college is a great time to explore ideas and, you know, a lot of the very, very early stuff is ex exploration and talking to people. And so um, no one was more open to talking to me than they were when I was like, hey, I'm a student. I would love to ask you a few questions about, um, you know, your, your situation. We talked to like the CMO of Adidas and uh, CMO of Nike and a bunch of these extremely high level people that I emailed with my Purdue.edu address um, while, while still in college. So that's um, there are pros and cons, but I think if you're trying to maintain your GPA while really doing it, it's um, probably losing proposition. They've said dot, dot .edu address, I can attest. When my dot .edu email went away, I was really sad because people Very sad, were less yeah. likely to talk to me for that product market fit. So take advantage of it. That mm -hmm. email is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so as uh, executives in these startup companies, um, you obviously have to work uh, a lot of time and initially maybe for not that much reward. Um, the idea is that it works out in the long run. Um, so to be such a hard worker, what kind of skills do you think you need to succeed um, as an entrepreneur, especially a young student entrepreneur? I think uh, the biggest skill is just ability to learn and try new things. So when I started working on Glimpse, um, so just to preface a little bit, in high school and just background, like I'm very engineering focused, very like numbers and data driven. But now I'm working in a business that's very marketing oriented, uh, more real world product oriented. To be able to shift that mindset going from just being pure, trying to build technology aspect to understanding the marketing aspect, of a business is really important. And I think um, I had to pick up a lot of skills that I didn't have before, like being able to sell, um, being able to negotiate, things like that. Um, understanding the marketing landscape and how to build a product are just things that I had no experience with before. But I think just being open to learning and trying things that are out of your comfort zone um, is probably the most key and needed um, skill to start a company. Awesome. Okay, well, um, one of the biggest topics right now uh, is obviously the coronavirus and the pandemic we're facing. Uh, and a pandemic is obviously going to affect how all companies do business and especially um, startup businesses. So Isha is going to ask a few questions about how the pandemic has affected your businesses and how you guys have adapted to it. Okay, yeah, thanks, Fisher. So we have a question for Catherine specifically. How do you think the world of research and development, specifically for biotechnology, will change post-COVID? What can we continue to do post-COVID that we've been doing, doing during COVID? Mm -hmm. uh, so the one thing I will say about biotechnology, so I'm in California, the second that everything shut down, everybody said, nope, you can keep coming in. You're doing biotechnology. Even if you're not mm -hmm. doing COVID, some discovery you make could help us with COVID. Go, go, go. Um, so I think that this is actually a, a very interesting time to be in biotechnology because suddenly everyone I know understands diagnostics. Everyone's an expert in sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, limit of detection. And I'm going, dad, you know what that is now? Really? I never, I never thought that this would be the day. Um, so I think that this holds a, a really interesting future for biotechnology because people are, are getting why diagnostics are important. Um, I think people understood why vaccines are important, but now that nobody wants to, to get SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, everyone's like, yes, I am on board. When is the vaccine coming out? I'm watching the news every day. Come on, let's go. Um, in terms of also you know, going into work versus not, I think it also showed uh, 
a lot of the scientists and engineers, they got to kind of go in, they got to do the testing, but it really helps show too how um, well you can do some of the remote work if you're not that scientist or that engineer, or maybe you're just writing a grant, so you don't really need to go in. But I think it, it really showed how to create that communication, how to get that work done. And yeah, the appreciation behind biotechnology has really, really taken off nowadays. And I, I, I hated that it came to be a pandemic to have to be at that point of understanding, but um, it is very interesting from being a founder and, and seeing this, this huge shift in the community and understanding. Yes, yeah. congratulations, actually. I think, well, I don't know if you're announcing it or not. So but on the grant front, I think uh, it's, it's, it has been a good time for you guys, right? It's been all right. Yeah, it's been all right. <laughs> cool. I, I, we've been following along. Too. We, we have been following along too. So, uh, yeah. I have another pandemic related question for Kushal this time. Uh, so for Kushal, how has your company used the COVID crisis to foster innovation in uh, whether technical in your programming or how your team works? Because I think you guys are a team, a, found, a group of three founders. Is that correct? Yeah, it's three of us. And yeah, COVID definitely uh, hit our business a little bit hard when it first came because we are uh, doing product placements in Airbnbs. And as you know, when COVID hit, uh, definitely short-term rentals, hospitality market took a really big hit. And I think what really got tested was our perseverance. Um, and continuing to push through the business. So in March, when bookings in these Airbnbs went very, very low, um, a lot of the work we'd done, we'd seen basically kind of diminish for the entire month. And, but we kept pushing. And what the good thing is, is that um, luckily bookings came back, state restrictions have been lifted and Airbnb is at the same point it is now uh, that it was in January. So bookings have come back. The thing that's changed is how travel looks like in the US. So I guess August, about one year ago, there would have been a lot of international travel. Instead, a lot of travel is now happening to um, getaway stays about 100 to 300 miles away from big urban centers. So like right out of New York or right out of LA, there's a lot of travel. So we really got tested in our perseverance as well as ability to adapt. So we had a lot of properties in our platform that were in these major cities. Um, but we quickly adapted and onboarded a lot more properties that were in some of these getaway stays, whether it's like upstate New York or like Big Bear Lake out of LA. Um, I think that's really where we had to make a quick business change, but um, it did pay off and Airbnb bookings are coming back. Yeah. Good to hear. Uh, and then Everett, you mentioned at the beginning that the pandemic has affected uh, your business both positively and negatively. Would you like to speak on that? Certainly. So, um, you know, we deal with a lot of retail and places with high foot traffic. And I think um, we are seeing a complete transformation and acceleration of things that were already happening before, um, but, but they're happening in, in a drastically accelerated time frame. Um, so we have uh, completely reimagined our product to be less about foot traffic and converting people in the moment to more about um, uh, sort of uh, brand engagement and experience and converting people when they buy online um, potentially later. So um, yeah, we have actually leaned into our largest customers and uh, to, to be quite frank, some of our smallest customers either cancel contracts or have shut down or it was, it was a really crazy time. I had one, um, one contract canceled because of force majeure, which is, means act of God. So um, in California, when they forced everyone to shut down, um, that was the impetus for um, one of our customers to, to cancel our contract. So yeah, it was a, it was a massive impact, um, but, but I'm actually heartened by it a little bit because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity or once in a decade opportunity, shall we say, for um, the way we do business in the US to completely change and several elements of our product fit into that narrative. So um, yeah, I, I would echo what the other panelists have said in that I think anytime you have a massive structural change underfoot, it's a great opportunity for entrepreneurs. Yeah, thank you guys for your insight. Uh, I think Fisher will have some questions regarding business life. Thanks, Isha. <clears throat> okay, so uh, maybe Everett and Catherine can answer this. Um, for day-to-day -day life, what does day-to-day -day life look like for an executive from a startup fresh out of university? Just in a general sense. 
Um, well, it's highly different. Um, mo most every day is different. I typically do it in weeks. So I have kind of things I do on Monday and things I do on Wednesday. Um, and then also between months, it varies. So for me, um, we are in about a six month fundraising cycle. So um, six months ago, I was raising a round, which means I was doing entirely VC meetings and kind of content around that. And that's happening again now. Um, and then um, between those times, typically there's been something that's like falling apart in the business um, that, that, and that requires some focus. So over the summer, I was actually back in Indiana at our um, Indianapolis office, working with our engineering team on, on reliability and kind of um, when you shift from smaller customers to larger customers, there's a expanded set of requirements to deal with. So yeah, it's quite varied. Um, and uh, the only thing I try to do or I'm working on doing is just trying to be more consistent, um, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time um, to deal with the variability. So um, yeah, not, not a very specific answer, but it, it, it varies widely. I can second that so much when he was saying, you know, it changes day to day, week to week, month to month. I'm going, yep, changes hour to hour sometimes. Um, when I first left and started kind of doing this full time, I eventually just had to sit down and say, okay, Mondays is to focus on product. Tuesdays is to focus on marketing. Wednesdays is to focus on finance. Thursdays, operations, Friday, because things do change so much. And sometimes, yeah, you'll get out of, you know, a couple hour long meetings back to back and suddenly something's on fire and you got to go fix it. And you're going, okay, well, there went my marketing day. And that's okay. I think flexibility is incredibly important to have and a lot of hustle at the same time. And that's kind of what helps with that variability. Uh, I think a lot of entrepreneurs like to wear many hats. So it's a little bit uh, easier to navigate around that. So yes, you're going to be wearing all the hats when you first finish your there's not going to, you can't say, I, I don't like finance, so I'm not going to handle it. Finance is kind of the core of what you're doing. You better be able to handle that. Or marketing. You can ask me any day. Marketing is not my specialty um, at all, but I, I had to do it. I had to work on it. So then you, you look to hire people and raise that money and grow so that there are people that can help wear some of those hats over mm -hmm. time. But right away out of, out of school when you're kind of doing this, yeah, you are you're bouncing around doing everything day to day. And I can't say that one day was ever like the previous day. So what do you think has been the hardest part of business life so far? Well, well, I'll let Catherine uh, go. <laughs> I was going to say uh, the hardest part. Um, I think, I don't know if it's the hardest, but it is the one that you're always putting a lot of energy into is one um, team dynamics and team culture, because you want to cultivate something that, is incredibly positive and that you work as a united front to get something out there. I would say that that's one. Um, the second that I've heard from a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of programs that I've been in is that sometimes entrepreneurship or being a founder can be a little bit isolating uh, because you are kind of at the forefront. You are trying to figure things out and you know, you're trying to be that, that steady ship to navigate around. And so that, that can be a little bit nuts sometimes. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, I, I like to kind of push individual projects forward, um, but it, uh, I've come around to the view that a whole day spent meeting with people and um, listening to them is, is actually work done as well. Uh, it doesn't have to just be uh, pitch decks or spreadsheets or, or even code. So um, yeah, the, the communication aspect and um, you know, if you can really if you can really be the multiplier for your team, if you can offload things that you do, um, you know, that's, uh, I think, difficult, especially if at first those things might be done in a, in a different way or, um, you know, in, in brutal honesty, a less effective way. But um, in the long run, the training and uh, focusing on the collaboration of the whole team is kind of your job versus just uh, doing things and then like passing down passing down orders. So that was a big shift for me, uh, still ongoing, but, um, but I definitely agree with Catherine that just the raw emotional communication of a startup uh, is, is probably one of the most important, important and difficult things. Would you say your experiences are similar, Kishal? 
Yeah, yeah, I definitely think so. Um, right now we're going through Y Combinator. And so we're at the stage where we go through this three month accelerator program uh, to try to build a business, get it off the ground. And then we go and raise a seed round of financing, uh, which our demo day is actually next week um, on Monday. And that's when we present to like a thousand investors um, to try to raise a new round of financing. Yeah. So like the last uh, few months has just been straight, like working nonstop, trying to get everything off the ground. Um, I think some of the hardest things for us in the early days is uh, operations, operationalizing everything, figuring out who's going to handle what and staying in order, uh, especially when we're trying to move as fast as possible. Um, I know Catherine talked about things breaking. Uh, you're trying to get something done one day and then something breaks and you're like, oh, I got to put my goal for today on the hole and fix this uh, issue is having with another client. I think these are problems we all face um, and it's definitely been really pleasant. So one thing you guys brought up was um, the team atmosphere of your employees. Uh, so as fresh graduates, especially, a lot of students might not have a ton of leadership experience. Um, so what do you think the best way is to encourage and be able to lead your employees? And how do you think you can most effectively foster a positive atmosphere? Well, lately I've been working on um, being more straightforward with expectations. Um, so coming out of school, I often found it was difficult to kind of say what I was really feeling or say in a way that was productive for the people. Um, but uh, this often causes more problems later than the initial maybe difficult reaction um, that someone might have. So for example, uh, we had a we had someone who was working on our hardware and um, one of the things we did during COVID was we were transitioning to more of a software company. So our, our computer vision software can now run on many more types of cameras um, besides our, our very specific cameras that we built. And, um, you know, so I, ha I had to say to our hardware person, look, I, you have three months to learn um, these kind of the set of software skills or else like there's really no place for you on the team anymore. And, um, you know, this is not something I would have communicated before. Uh, I, I think, but, but experience has taught me that not, not um, saying the like severity of the situation, the need of the team, uh, and then, and then like being frustrated later and everyone's freaking out w uh, w would be worse. So I, I think that's one thing I find many people I talk to straight out of college are, they actually feel very strongly and feel very passionate about certain things, but they, they don't really want to surface it um, because you know, someone might get a little bit offended or a little bit scared or panicked. And actually you, you want to know about if they're feeling that way about what you're feeling like right away. So that's just personal anecdote that I'm working on at the moment that I think has been broadly very helpful for me. Would you agree, Catherine? Do you have similar experiences? I mean, absolutely. But also to add to it is when I was having some troubles in my own company um, with particularly like culture and things like that, is I sat down and I had studied how all these companies had cultural values. And at first, you know, I had this engineering background. I was like, cultural values, it doesn't feel like it means that much. It's just like five words somebody chose, like yeah. happiness, humility. And I was just like, what does that mean? Um, but then I said, I'm going to try this. And I came up with five cultural values that we had, um, transparency, communication, uh, you know, showing gratitude to work together as a team, uh, you know, when you show up, really show up, things like that. And then what I noticed is that when I started sticking to my cultural values and sharing this directly with my team, they also started to reflect these cultural values. And when we weren't, I don't know how this has happened. We keep very open communication because that is a cultural value. We check each other on it. Um, sometimes it's hard to be transparent. I will be honest. Sometimes it is so hard to be transparent, but that is one of our core values is transparency. And so that's, that's really helped me. So I think that's one way that it's really helps working as a team and helping my leadership skills is to create this idea of what do I really want my company to look like? How do I want people to truly behave? as a team. And so that was one really big thing um, that I would say helped quite a bit. And then the second one is um, I am willing to be with my team to take out the garbage at night. 
I'm willing to be with my team to, you know, run the errand to FedEx. And I think that that's incredibly important because when you're there to build a shelf together or a chair or put together lab equipment or figure out some software that makes you want to like drop kick, kick your computer across the room, these are huge team building experiences because you're doing it together. You're not acting like there's some strange hierarchy. People respect you a lot more because you're willing to sit down and build that shelf or to get angry at a piece of software and start yelling at it or something, but it, it helps create that, that team dynamic and that, that leadership. And then the final one that I would say is that when your employees shine, you shine. So I think people are really ready to take a lot of credit for things, but when other people on your team shine, you also shine. So like, let people go do what they need to do, get out of their way, let them do their job and let them shine. That is a huge part of being a leader. Thanks. For future Thanks entrepreneurs, so if there's software that's making Catherine uh, pull her hair out, you know, maybe you should ask her about it. You know, it could be an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, so on the topic of team atmosphere, um, one of the uh, most prevalent source of feedback I got uh, when starting to write my NSF SBIR proposal was that I need to have a co-founder I can trust for my company. Um, and the that founding a company is many, many times easier if you have someone that you trust or someone you're friends with to found it with you. So a lot of students might not have someone that's exactly like that, um, and not immediately. So what do you think you should look for when determining, hey, is this person just a friend or can I found a, a company with this person? Um, what kind of skills do you think that person needs to bring to your company? And um, if you don't have this kind of person, how do you think you can find one, especially now in this virtual kind of world we live in yeah i think the most important thing um is i think shared values so if you can find people you share the same values with or the same goals uh, i think getting started with them is probably the best way um so akash anuj and i the three of us we were all on delta Mu kappa so we were already in this community as very entrepreneurially focused uh, and the way we started working was starting to work on side projects together so it wasn't a commitment. We weren't starting a company off day one. It was more to get to know each other. And I think that worked really well. Uh, we became really close. Like we're basically, all three of us are brothers now. Um, but we, live, we live together, we're very close, but it started uh, because we're looking to do a side project together. And I think um, even if you don't have a co-founder in mind, if you have someone who you know, or someone in the community that you're a part of, you probably share some set of values and you could get along and starting to work together with them on side projects, seeing where something goes for 30 days, seeing if you work well together, is probably uh, the, what, the way I've found to get started the best. I see, cool. Um, one question that we got, and uh, I just wanted to hear your guys' opinion on it because I thought it was an interesting question. Someone asked, uh, as a student without entrepreneurial experience, do you think it's better to build experience at a company beforehand, or should you just work on studying entrepreneurship and uh, uh, starting a business on your own as soon as possible, if you have an idea already? So for me personally, um, I think getting started, you can start anytime. And some of the best experience comes from trying something and learning. I think no experience is the best experience, to be honest. But um, experience does matter. So my freshman year, I did um, a internship at this startup in California. They're called iFi, and they build like these AI-based nano stores. Uh, and for them, I learned a lot. So I was doing a lot of different things for them um, there. And one of the things was selling. And that's where I really got into the side of business development. Um, and combining that with like, a tech background, I think that's what really helped me um, start um, this business. And I think that you don't need to have a lot of experience to start. You just need to have, I think, something you're passionate about and the rest of the pieces will fall in line. I remember when Anuj, Akash and I started, um, there were so many things we didn't know. We didn't know how to onboard a customer. How do you invoice a customer? How to price? Like these are things that if you try to focus on from day one, uh, you won't make any progress because you're too focused on like the small details. I think if you just look at the big picture, if you find a problem you're passionate about, you can get started any day. Uh, and I think that really no experience 
or experience, you can still um, get to the same place at the end of the day. Yeah, I would say uh, if you don't want to work on your startup right away, don't join a big company because you'll stay there forever. Money's much better. That makes sense. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know if there's a, a perfect experience that you need. I can definitely say I had zero business experience, but by remaining coachable and just trying to do everything like biomed ship at Purdue, trying pitch competitions that I could find, uh, doing accelerators, whoever would accept me and talk to me. Um, that was that part of the way that worked for me, but I think everyone's going to be so different and it's, it's hard to, to fit into a box, which I know is a really frustrating answer because you're just like no tell me tell me the exact answer to my path to this question but it really does depend but you can find ways to be coachable yeah i agree i definitely don't think that um a lack of work experience is a giant barrier to entry especially because of how many entrepreneurship programs places like purdue offer um and we have about 15 minutes left so i'll go ahead and pass it back to isha and she will ask about opportunities um, to help students build their entrepreneurship skills yeah, thanks, Isher. Uh, so I have some questions here about opportunities to help students, but before that, I have a question specifically for, for Everett. So Everett, can you talk uh, about how you acquired your largest customer? Um, yes, uh, our second largest customer showed them our product. <laughs> so um, that's what you want. Uh, that's uh, when that starts happening. That's a great time. But to to get our second largest customer, um, I connected with. I was actually a home builder in Indianapolis who I knew was connected to, to the guy I wanted to speak to at this company. Um, so it was actually, it was um, research working backwards on, on LinkedIn in general, and then um, kind of purposeful introductions and relationship building. So very different, um, but in, in the enterprise space, this is often, I think, how it's done. Um, I, I know of one company where their investors uh, just called their first 10 customers and was like, why don't we sign you up? And they, and they basically said yes. Yeah. So um, it's very different in different sectors, but in enterprise, it's generally some sort of relationship um, uh, relationship thing. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, cool. So I'll move on to the uh, opportunities to help students. Uh, so for, for any of you, what kind of support was available for you in school related to entrepreneurship or was there none? Can you guys also talk a little bit about that? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think I, I can start. There was a lot of support um, for us in particular from Purdue and from some of the communities on campus. So coming to Purdue, as I mentioned, I joined Delta Mu Kappa. Uh, I think that fraternity was really helpful in building um, the entrepreneur community on campus. So there used to be this building called Anvil. It's still a club organization on campus. And um, Akash and Nuj and I would literally spend like hours there every day, like from 8 p.m. until like 1 a.m. just working every single day. And I think that that was really helpful, having a shared space to work. Uh, on top of that, Entrepreneurship 200, that certificate program class, I took it as a freshman and I was in the uh, learning community. I think that was really instrumental. Um, my professor was Mike Cassidy. And he did such a good job at sharing his experience, his personal experience of starting a company that I think it really motivated me and I know a lot of other students in the class to work on something. And I think that he was instrumental in opening my ideas, my eyes, the idea of starting a company and how accessible it is for students to do so. Um, and then also alongside that, I know Purdue has a lot of resources. So Firestarter is a program that Foundry runs. Um, and they help you get your company off the ground. They have like weekly meetings where they give you advice and tips. And I think that that's really useful um, for someone who has an idea and kind of wants to go through kind of like a class environment to get the company off the ground. Um, and then on top of that, alumni have been really helpful, especially right now we're raising another round of financing and alumni connections um, in Silicon Valley have been really helpful for us to get some money and like start investor conversations and pitch people. So I think if you can reach out to Purdue alumni or start building those connections, that's really, really valuable. Yeah, totally. Um, so I, uh, so let me think. 
three Purdue alumni are angel investors in our company. Um, not to brag, but I introduced the Glimpse guys to one of their angel investors. Um, so I do think that's, uh, that's a big part of it. Being on this call is a great start. You can, I think, email any of us and, and we'll always talk to you. And then I think our research too. I love research, still a big technology person, um, you know, and almost too much in the eyes of some VCs, but that's okay. And so I was involved with a lot of student research at Purdue. And um, honestly, that's where, that's where the passion came from. That's where all the opportunities came from. And Dr. Liu, who uh, is on this call, was, was a, you know, one of the great, uh, great influences in my life. So um, yeah, for me, it was a lot of the research opportunities at Purdue. Um, for me, it was my co-founders or professors had had experience already at Purdue, so they were able to kind of guide me and say, hey, some of these resources exist. Go take a look. I think that was one. Uh, the second is some of the competitions that they have around campus that I mentioned earlier in the call. I don't know if they do SURES or not anymore, the SURES Innovation Competition. That was the very first one I ever did before I knew what the heck a pitch was. Um, and then the, the Burton Morgan as well. And then also just going to the foundry and people are very receptive to talk to you there. People want to talk to you. Uh, and I got an entrepreneur in residence at the time for a year or two who was excellent, uh, loved working with her, was just a huge saving grace for me. Um, and then finally, I know like somebody mentioned Entrepreneurship 200 or I forget what the class was called, but also in the, the grad school, they have biomedship for biomedical engineers with the business college that comes together and merges teams that are business students and engineering, which is fantastic to find that product market fit or any like nodal i -core kind of programs is really good to find that product market fit. Yeah, we encourage everybody to take advantage of all of the opportunities that Purdue provides. Uh, have any of you studied abroad? And if so, how vital do you think a study abroad experience is in relation to starting your own business? Well, I wanted to, but then I failed some classes because I was working on this company, so I had to, I had to take more credits, so. so I guess it's not then. <laughs> Um, I studied abroad, but I went somewhere else for my undergrad, and I think it was huge for me because it changed my entire path of wanting to do appropriate technology rather than work on pacemakers and stents. So for me, it was a, a huge opportunity, and it completely changed what I wanted to do. Okay. Uh, I think I can ask one more question about opportunities to help students, and we'll have a final wrap-up question. So what do you think universities can improve on to support student entrepreneurship? Or what do you wish that was there to help support you as you took on this journey? So I've been agitating for Purdue to set up their own venture fund. Um, IU has a venture fund, so I really think Purdue should have one. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, I think it's just the uh, uh, facilitating connections. I, I'm not sure what the current status of the Anvil is. I, I have heard that it's slightly changing or something, but that was a big, big part of it for me. I could go and hang out with uh, all other students that were interested in startups in a bit of an informal way. So I think more of those spaces is, uh, would definitely be helpful for, for students. There are actually really good questions in the uh, audience chat box. Uh, sorry, Kushal, would you, were you going to speak on this topic before I go, move on to the next question? Yeah, I was just gonna add, I think one thing that could be really um, helpful is even in like the very engineering focused classes, tying in entrepreneurship. So like um, EC368, data structures, algorithms, or maybe EC20875, um, uh, Python for data science. I can see a lot of applications of how you could tie in like industry type of projects where you have to actually create something that can potentially provide business value um, and so you have that engineering side, that component, but then also you have the opposite side where you see how can I turn something I have built for a classroom project into seeing does it have market um, viability, how can that work? I think uh, that can foster like a community or get into the mindset of students to look at like everything from a business perspective. I think that that could be something that could be interesting. We have one good question um, from the chat. What advice would you give to students who want to pursue a business idea, but might have student debt that might dissuade them? Uh, 
I think you should pay off the debt first. Uh, so I've actually gone into debt in the course of this company in some cases. So you, I think you should actually have some reserves before you do it. Yeah, or work part time while you have a job that really is helping with with that debt <laughs> and getting those those bills paid off for sure. It's it's tough as an entrepreneur, and there is a likelihood that you can go into debt. Uh, we have another question about uh, Purdue education. So one person would like to ask about how a Purdue education reflects on the startups of entrepreneurs and how what they have learned in class that helps them the most in running their businesses. You know, I think one of the biggest things that I learned from Purdue and class in general is a solid work ethic. Um, I think that a lot of the things that we do in class um, may not directly translate in our every day to day work and operations, um, but the basic foundation of working hard is what has been built um, through our classes. And then a lot of the classes that have been really instrumental, um, I think, came a lot from. Um, yeah, working hard as well as an entrepreneurship side, that certificate program, learning from past experience, hearing other entrepreneurs do something like this before and what their thought process is like. That's been really helpful um, in getting off the ground. Yeah, that um, makes sense. If I could interject for a moment. Uh, speaking about university opportunities, uh, at the beginning of the lecture, or sorry, the panel, it's not a lecture. Um, we talked about the Build My Startup uh, VIP team, and that's for uh, teams and students that already have their business idea. But Kushal also mentioned uh, Entrepreneurship 200. Um, so I would, that is for students who don't have this idea yet and aren't ready to take this idea to business. So if you're interested in entrepreneurship, um, I think those are the two top things to look for. Um, I also did Firestarter myself and can recommend it. Um, it's modeled after the National Science Foundation's i -Corps program. Um, so those are three great opportunities for um, all students to look into. Fisher, if I can interject also, the, our business model competition, all you need to have is a rough idea and it's a great opportunity to flush it out. And as well as two of the panelists, win some money to get your, your startup going. There's actually a question about uh, business competitions as well. Um, if you've been through a business competition, which I think all of you have, uh, how did the experience help you or how did it not help you? Um, one thing that helped is it made me get my butt in gear to have a really good pitch and to have a good plan if it was like an actual business plan type of competition. And also the questions from the judges. That is amazing practice because sometimes, some, I mean, especially when you're starting, somebody's going to come out of left field and you're going to go, I did not think about that. So I think that those are some really great ways that helped. It also helped me get a thicker skin for some of the, the types of judges that was asked certain questions because people are going to question you no matter what. You just have to have the conviction to know why it can be done. And so I think that that's also incredibly helpful. Yeah, I definitely agree with what Catherine said. And I think one of the really valuable things, especially for the Burton uh, D. Morgan uh, competition, is that it provides a lot of structure to your company. So the way that one works in particular is they, it's a, uh, you have to basically build a business canvas and you're basically pitching your business model. So a lot of the, a lot of the conversation and questions you get from judges is around the viability of your model and you proving it. So it provides a lot of structure um, for like entrepreneurs, especially because one of the biggest challenges in building a startup is making decisions um, with very little data. A lot of the decisions you make as to like how to make iterations on your product is from anecdotal data you might hear from uh, customers and not really anything that you can do like statistical analysis on. Uh, so I think the business model canvas is really, really helpful um, in that it's very formulaic uh, and structured in building a company and they test you to see how you've made decisions, how you validate and invalidated hypotheses. Cool, well, I think that just about covers everything. Um, we're just about out of time here. 
Um, that has covered all the different topics that we wanted to discuss. I think we got a lot of valuable information, especially for students who are looking to become entrepreneurs and maybe aren't totally secure in the decision yet. Um, so I think we're going to end it here. Um, thank you so much, you guys, for attending the panel, um, especially our panelists who spoke. Um, and uh, I wish you guys well and good luck. <laughs>